So let's get started. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce our two speakers. Uh, Naresh Ramchandani, uh, who's a partner at Pentagram. He's founder of Do The Green Thing. He actually did found, uh, further back in his career, two advertising agencies. Uh, he's also a trustee of DNAD. Uh, and Naresh will be taking the side of generalists. Uh, and we also have, I'm delighted to welcome Kat O'Neill. Uh, Kat is an award-winning uh, editorial illustrator based in Edinburgh, and she will be exploring the specialist angle. So without further ado, Kat, why don't you get us started? Over to you. Well, it seems I'm a bit of the underdog here, looking at that poll. So talking about um, generalist versus specialist, the thing is, in any industry, you, you do need both. So I'm sort of more explaining why I chose to be a specialist and the benefits that I've seen from that. When, when you're deciding between the two, you're really kind of looking between breadth, having a really wide range of knowledge, or depth, having a really specific understanding of something. And I went for that one. So I'm going to talk you through a little bit of why I went that way. I'm just going to share my screen with you to uh, show you a little bit of what I mean. So when I first went to art school, first you make the decision of you're going to go into art and design. And that's a pretty general field, as we all know. And most of you will probably have done a foundation year. So you'll be trying different specialisms within that year. For the sake of this, we're going to talk about VizCom. So that's illustration, graphic design, photography, film and TV, animation. Now, a lot of people find they really thrive in this environment, getting to try all of these different things. But if you find that just one specific thing, you know, you really enjoy it and really have a passion for it, that's when you start to get more and more specialist. So for me, I specialized in illustration for my undergrad degree. So that was getting briefs and responding to it by creating a visual representation that's intended for publication, whether that's in print media or online. Usually it's intended for a reproduction of some kind. So that's already getting pretty specific. But even within that specialism, you have separate little specialisms as well. So in illustration, you're kind of split into three main categories. So that's publishing, editorial, and advertising. As we're a bit tight on time, I'm not gonna go too much into the other categories, but with editorial, which is my specialism, that's mostly newspapers and magazines. So the focus on that is communicating an idea. It's conceptual, unless you get into things like travel illustration, which is a bit more decorative maybe. So when you're communicating an idea, the way that I do this is visual metaphor, lots of forced connections. So for example, with this illustration, this was for Liberation, which is a French newspaper I work with quite regularly. Um, when we're looking at things like the current COVID-19 pandemic, we're kind of over, overrun with images of the same thing. You're always seeing that ball with little red dots on it and it can get quite exhausting seeing the same repetitive imagery over and over again. So for this article, uh, which was about how the virus might change, we don't really know, and whether it counts as a living thing, it's my job to come up with something that is not cliche, it's different to photography, otherwise you just use photography. So I was taking the idea of adapting and change and metamorphosis, and one of the most well-known things to change is butterflies emerging from a chrysalis. So I use that visual metaphor, something that's not inherently connected with viruses in any way, and I force that connection together. So here we have a butterfly with the COVID-19 uh, imagery on its wings to show that connection. Similarly, with this article, which was about the price of life, how politicians will place different amounts of value on life when we're in times of crisis, say in warfare or in the current pandemic situation and make economic decisions based on what they think is pragmatic. That article, it could have something quite cliche, like, I don't know, someone holding money, a life being traded for coins or something like that. But 
as a specialist in my field, I, I really want to go beyond the surface level. I want to think of something unusual that is maybe a bit more emotive, something that a photograph, like you, you're trying to get something that you couldn't get from another kind of specialism. So I went for the visual image of a rose, which is something very delicate, it's beautiful, but then when you're juxtaposing it with something harsh, like the idea of choosing if someone lives or dies, that's quite a, a shocking thing to see. It's, it makes you think about it in a different context. So as a specialist, my job is to have a really in-depth understanding of how to approach visual imagery. I'm gonna um, stop sharing my screen now. So when I get a brief, I have to think about things like the concept, the composition, color, technique, all of these different things. And to me, that feels like a lot of things that I need to consider. But within a specialism, it, it is a very narrow focus. But as a specialist, I want to be the best illustrator I can possibly be. And that only comes with practice and focusing on that one thing, doing it over and over and over again. So with each project I do, I learn a bit more about how to tackle the subject matter. I learn a little bit more about how to approach technique. And the payoff of this is that I get faster and better at it. I improve the technique. So in terms of employability, that's actually really useful because it means, you know, when I first graduated, it might take me a week to produce an image. And now I can do it in six hours, less than, because I need to send sketches first. So I'm very fast and my clients all know this. So another thing as a specialist is that when I'm working with clients, I build up a reputation for being very, very good at a very specific thing. So they know, oh, let's say they've got a deadline, really short, they need this turnaround done in a day. They know to call me because they know that I'll do it quickly and they know that I'm reliable. I always hit the deadline and I'll give them a range of options. I won't just give them one idea. I'll give them at least three options to go for. So as a specialist, I can, I can only really hone those skills if I focused on that one line of work, which isn't to say that a generalist isn't good at lots of different things, but it's just if I'd done lots of different things, maybe I wouldn't be quite so fast. I probably wouldn't get those really short commission deadlines. So with my work now, I can rely on quite a steady stream of commissions because art directors know that I can do those sorts of things. They're employing someone who's an expert in that particular field. I think that when you're choosing whether to be a specialist or a generalist, I wouldn't necessarily go for in terms of a pragmatic, what's the most employable decision? Because to be honest, we're in art and design, we're not really doing it for a huge amount of money anyways. But I think what's really important is choosing what comes natural to you, what is your instinct to go for. So when you get given a brief, if you're immediately thinking all of the different possible options that you could do, could this be a film? Could this be an animation? Could I do this as a sound piece? probably more interested in a generalist perspective which is great um but if you're thinking oh i really want to hone down exactly how i produce images do i want to think about things from different compositions do i want to think about all these different influences that i can have in this imagery then you're probably more of a specialist but i think the most important thing is choosing something that you care about and are passionate about because it's it's really about how hard you work in terms of getting jobs and employability, because the more that you care about something, the harder that you will probably work in that particular field. And for me, I, I really love illustration, clearly. So it was easy for me to push myself to work that hard in that discipline. And I also want to say that what you choose to do now is it's not what you're tied to for the rest of your life as well. So for me, although I'm a specialist, there are quite a few things I'd like to branch my work out towards. Like I want to learn some more animation. I want to learn some more design. I want to try all these different things as well. And although I'm a specialist at this point in my career, the thing is I'm just 30. I've got all of those years ahead that I can still do that thing. So I think you can be a specialist and then specialize in different things and maybe be a bit of a slow generalist as well. So maybe I'm kind of hedging my bets on both sides. Kat, thank you very much. You slightly, I, I, very compelling. Uh, so uh, let's hand straight over to Naresh. Naresh, if you want to 
switch yourself on and then hear hear the argument in favour of generalists. Thanks, Gareth. Thanks, Tim, and thanks, Kat. Uh, <clears throat> I must say, if I could do what Kat does, um, I would love. I mean, I would love to be a specialist. And when I see um, what Kat does, I think it's really, really um, brilliant and inspiring, and uh, flies a flag, flies a very clear and strong flag for the specialist cause. Um, when DNAD, um, when Hillary and DNAD invited me to be part of this debate, I must say my first thoughts were not kind to the generalist. Um, uh, you know, other words for generalists are um, all rounders, um, jack of all trades, which is swiftly followed by master of none. And um, in many ways, um, at least from my initial perspective, the generalist idea is not, um, is not inspirational or aspirational. Um, and even the word I don't like, I mean, compared to the crispness and the sharpness of a specialist with its really, really nice crisp consonants, um, the word generalist, generalist, sounds dour and bored with itself. Um, and I think the problem is this, we're creative people, we're doers, that's what we are, and we look up to specialists, uh, we look up to people who do very specific things very, very well. You know, ooh, if you want this, you have to go to them. They know everything there is to know and can do everything there is to do about this one very defined but very tangible thing. Um, you know, there's a there's a glamour in that. Looking at what Cat does, there's a real there's a real attractiveness to being um, so good at that thing she does. Um, and I've known specialists in um, very odd, um, doing very odd specialisms. Like I know one person who's brilliant at actually doing um, particular user journeys for one demographic across we across websites. And when you need someone to look at that particular audience and and plot user and plot user journey websites that is the person to go to. I know someone who was a great art director of perfume ads. And when you need a perfume ad, you go to this art director. Uh, and these people, um, and even Kat, I think, is proof that specialism is a role, but it's more than a role. It's a reputation. Um, and it's about, you know, specialism is about being special in that sense. Because when have you ever envied a generalist? Um, I actually wrote an article a couple of years back about this um, for Creative Review. And I argued that um, I'd done strategy, but I wasn't a strategist. And I directed things, but I wasn't a director. I'd done public speaking, but I wasn't a public speaker. Uh, my only real specialism was as a writer, and maybe even that's debatable. So it sounds like I'm arguing against generalism uh, and for specialism. But uh, I think there are problems with the specialist idea. Um, when I was thinking about it in the, in the run-up to this talk, um, this debate, I was thinking that it's actually not it's not always easy to be a specialist. If you only do one thing, um, you know, creativity is, um, is, a, is a process. And if you only do one thing in this process, you need to be in a place where, out, where others are doing everything else. And that's not always possible. Sometimes you're not in a large enough agency where you can specialize, where every single person or every single um, group or team can actually be about one thing, something that's not possible. Sometimes that's not possible. Uh, or sometimes you're not far enough along in your career to be special to be a specialist in one thing um, and so I was thinking that for certain people towards maybe towards the big beginning of their career specialism may seem like um, an unachievable idea or maybe even the wrong kind of idea and this is where I can start to argue for being a generalist because um, if you think of a generalist not as a jack of all trades like I said which is not a very it's not a very aspirational thought but as someone who's interested in all parts of the process and someone who's ready to help out anywhere, then it makes a lot of sense to be a generalist. Um, it makes a lot of sense as a person joining an agency, uh, which is sort of my experience, and is happy to participate in projects that need more thinking or projects that need more research, as well as projects that need more creativity. Um, or to be, a, to be a generalist across different styles, because it might be that you, um, will be asked to be part of a, um, a project that's about t taking something very seriously um, or um, very emotionally or uh, be part of a project that needs um, a particular kind of humour. And so actually being a generalist in that sense can actually be very helpful at the beginning. Um, or projects that need, for example, interactive behaviour or projects that need broadcast behaviour. Um, and it, makes a, it also makes a lot of sense if you're not joining an agency, but you're either independent or thinking of going independent because in that position, I think it's really tough and limiting uh, to uh, certainly in, the, in, in, in my type of role, you know, design or advertising, 
I think it's very it's very tough or limiting to um, to specialize or only do one part of the process. Uh, and I'm not saying that if you're a designer and a client asks you if you know how to get some research done, that you put your hand up and say you can do it, because I think that would be wrong. That would be phony. Um, but to know about research and know what stage it needs to happen at and what kind of research it needs to be, and therefore what kind of researcher um, uh, would be right and is best to suggest, that's a little bit of generous knowledge that really helps your client and actually I think also really helps you. Yeah. So if generalism is being curious and interested and literate in all parts of the process, um, and if it's about giving you the knowledge base um, and confidence to lend a hand when a hand would help, I think generalism and generalists are about being interested and interested and therefore really, really great things to be. Um, I still don't like the word generalism. I think the word needs a rebrand. Uh, it's either too military or too humdrum. You know, you're either a general or you're just general. Um, but I'm ready to get over that. And I think there's a lot of value in being a generalist now. Duresh, thank you very much. Um, that was succinct. I, I, I suspect we might be coming to a place where uh, you agree with each other. Um, but I, I just want to put something to both to both of you, Kat. May, maybe you first. Is part of this about how far uh, any individual is from the actual creative coalface? By which I mean, in your case, Kat, putting an actual pen to paper and creating an image. I mean, it, it, is, is specialism sort of more more important, more attractive? As, as you get down to the actual doing, the, the actual, you know, practice of creativity. D d does that ring, does that chime with you at all, Kat? Is that? I think, I think as a specialist, I certainly have a lot of freedom to really just focus on making images and not have to, so, so as Naresh was saying that as a generalist, maybe we can think of a different term for that. Um, <laughs> you are having to think about all of the different stages of a process, which, on the one hand can be very liberating because you have lots of different things that you can be involved in, but on the other hand can also be quite tiring because, for example, as an illustrator, I never really have to think about production. I never have to think about, oh, I have to take things to the printer and get how the run of whatever done and what kind of paper is everything going to be done on. I don't, it's just really not anything I have Lucky to worry you. about. <laughs> yeah, uh, when I send my images to an art director, I don't need to think about how are they going to fit that in the website and how are the GIFs going to run in all of the different social medias. It's just not something I need to worry about. Um, so in some regards, yes. Um, in others, I think sometimes people mistakenly think that as a specialist, you are just doing that one thing. So for example, oh, you're brilliant at drawing. That must mean that you can be a great illustrator. When actually, to be honest, I know a lot of excellent draftsmen who find the actual work of being an illustrator too difficult because you need all those other skills like the ability to talk to people, to have good people skills and be just business savvy. I think though that the different, a big difference is that most of the time I'm just working with art directors who are familiar with the process of commissioning, whereas in an agency you're having to deal with the public in general and you can get people asking a lot of things that are very complicated that don't really make much sense, I'm sure. Thank you, Kat, that's great. Doris, let me put that sort of same point to you in a slightly different way. Are, are generalists kind of what you want at certain points in the creative process and specialists what you want at other points in the creative process? Is that actually what we're talking about here in order to... Um, I think I think you I think that is very very true actually Tim um, that really makes a lot of sense to me because I think for example at the beginning of a creative process say the agency process the one I know best um, I think they are um, a client will come to you um, I mean some clients will come to you because you are um, you are the agency who operates in pharma and they need absolute pharma literacy and anything other than that will be a waste of time but generally what happens is the opposite. You get clients who come in who need an agency to think a little bit outside their sector, you know, to bring um, wisdom from observations of other types of clients and bring them to your business so that you're the first to actually benefit from those. So I think actually there's um, a virtue to a broader set of um, experiences um, and you could call that generalism. And then I really agree with you that I think um, the further you go towards execution, um, what generally happens is the pressure goes up um, yeah. and uh, and clients, um, you know, while we can think 
while we often think that it's great that clients, you know, the best clients want to be really brave, I think every client wants to be safe. That's why they're paying large fees to agencies. Um, they want to be sure of a result. And um, I think to, as you get closer to execution and you want something to be excellently, excellently executed, you, you feel it's a, it's a better bet to bet on a specialist, isn't it, than a generalist. Um, so I think, I think, I think you're right. As you, as you go down the process, you, you turn more to specialism. Yeah. As you sort of progress down that development funnel. Yeah. So Matt, if it, you're, you're one of those wonderfully fortunate people who, you know, makes money out of the thing they love, which is the kind of, you know, dream state. Uh, if, if, if it, I, I'm sort of want to get here to, to, to a question, which is, can you be a serial specialist? Can you, can you specialize in one thing like illustration at the moment? What would your second passion be, Kat? If you, if you were forbidden from ever illustrating again, what, what would you turn to? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, on a complete tangent, I love podcasts, so I'd love to get into talk radio. But um, in a creative field, um, yeah, because al although I specialize in terms of work, I, I find it's quite important to have other creative outlets so that, that don't have the pressure of it being a commission. So... I actually quite like book binding, for example. So um, I actually have an example just here. Um, sorry for sirens in the background. <laughs> Clearly, Edinburgh is a very harsh place. Um, I it was <laughs> it was my husband's thirtieth, and I book bound him uh, this. And it was one of those skills that like we did in art school that I always really loved. And I think it's really important as a creative to keep other skills sharp, just have other creative outlets as well. Quite. Noresh, what, 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 uh, you, you are multi-talented, I know that because I've known you for a long, quite a long time. Uh, what, 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 if you could rank your, your sort of specialist skills in order of priority, what would they be? You said you were a writer, obviously, and a, a, you know, yeah. a very brilliant one, if I may say so. What, 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 are, what are your other, what, what, what would you specialise in if you couldn't write again, for instance? Um, well, I, I think um, that's very kind of you to say. I'm 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 a I'm a jobbing writer. I can I can make I can force a bit of writing to come out good if I spend long enough at it. There are yeah. people on my team who are just I'm just enviously enviably fluent. Um, so if you went for my 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 specialism within what I do, I'd say my specialism's probably short form writing. It's probably things like. Um, naming or copy or copywriting headlines or or end lines or that sort of promotional messaging stuff i think that's probably my specialism if you want um if you want a specialism within that i think i'm very good at knowing when to use a semicolon but right. that that may have limited application i think i i think broaden that i think it would be things that um where language has you know play plays a plays a part so it's helping um either us for do the green thing or pentagram right points of view um you know pieces in in the design press or broader um pieces about um environmentalism or points of view about the creative industry that's the sort of the broader set and then beyond that um i suppose beyond that i'm not sure how um commercial the projects get but it's really great to kind of keep my um um to, so i suppose sharpen um or take take ch take chances on writing that aren't necessarily things that um um things that help my um, reputation or work but they are things that keep me fresh and keep me thinking about writing so for example um you know i wrote an album and then learning how to write um lyrics i wrote an album as a ridiculous personal project and learning how to write lyrics um is very very different from learning how to write um prose or sa sales copy but it's so it's such a brilliant piece of learning and it sharpens my day job um Similarly, I wrote um, a poem on Twitter for every day for a year, and that was completely different. But that also sharpens um, my, my day job. So I think there is some value in those personal projects, because as you specialise, I think you don't necessarily get um, um, new lenses on the things you do just by doing it. Sometimes it helps to step outside uh, and sort of relearn or become a beginner or uh, um, get some more uh, inspiration around the area that you're a specialist in to re-infuse that specialism. Yes. I have to just jump in there and say I, I really agree with that because I think having tangential interests that are sort of they're the kind of related but not quite have been really really informative to anyone's work I mean as a specialist as well but so although with my work it is illustration I find 
pretty much all kinds of visual communication are really interesting for me to absorb and it does feed into the work. So for example, I watch so many films and I love film analysis and it's, it's, in, it's different enough that it's like a break from work, but it's similar enough that I can take lessons learned from that and feed it into things. Yeah, I've, 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 that touches on something that actually steps slightly away from, you know, the generalist versus specialist debate, which is, which is how creative people keep themselves fresh uh, and stimulated ge generally. And I, I, I think, Kat, what you're touching on there is how important it is to have really positive inputs in order to create these brilliant outputs. Would you, would you say that? I mean, it, you, you just have said it, actually. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it's so important just to go out and experience things for it to feedback into your work i mean no matter what you're doing as a creative person you're always yeah you're always pushing your work but you need to have external influence to keep everything fresh as well yeah Naresh, what do you uh... i totally totally agree i think um creativity is um i think it's um it goes with the job it's um it's just an optimistic role you have to be optimistic and uh because you have to believe that um the organization you're representing or the service um, you're, you're representing, you're able to uh, in some way help it. Um, you're, you're able to sort of help package it up to get people to see its quality. And I think that's, um, that's you know, with a strong idea or a strong piece of execution. And I think that's a really optimistic thing. Uh, and it's hard, to, it's hard to stay optimistic for 365 days of the year. Um, yeah. And I think actually top ups of optimism, it won't always come from your job. Sometimes they can come from um, uh, other other side projects or other or going to see going to see shows or going to experience other people's creativity or starting some side projects of your own. And I think those always need to come in because um, you you basically you you spend your life being optimistic, and um, sometimes the optimism doesn't regenerate from just that work. It needs to be generated from other things as well. Yeah. Uh, you, that's another great segue, actually. You're doing my job for me here. <laughs> so, I, I mean, it, the, we've seen the rise of the side hustle and other sort of, and, you know, people with kind of multiple uh, projects going, almost multiple careers, uh, as it's, you know, it's difficult to make a living these days, goodness knows, and, and will be, you know, for the foreseeable future. D does that work against specialism, do you think? Or, or, or are we back in the same area? Some people should specialise and become brilliant at one thing others will probably need to be good at a range of things what, what, what would I guess Kat is asking really for a comment on on the, you know on the current situation work-wise and and creative-wise and other any thoughts on that it's a it's a difficult one um certainly when I first started out I had a lot of part-time jobs I did a lot of teaching which I really enjoyed um but there did come a point where it it takes a lot of patience and I think as a graduate and even now you're you're so pumped up to like do the thing and you're like yeah I've trained for four years and I want to do the thing and but then you kind of need to pay your dues a little bit um it can be a bit of a bits and pieces lifestyle for sure um and there are certainly compromises so for for me working full-time as an illustrator that is with the caveat of I, I don't spend a lot of money in general. So if I had maybe higher overheads, it wouldn't be a sustainable career path. Um, and I think, I mean, when I graduated, it was also the height of the recession. So I graduated uh, in 2011. So it was just after the 2008 financial crash. Yep. So I, I really do feel for students who are graduating right, right now, but I also think like you, you can do it like the world needs art and design it's always going to need it so and there's no reason why it can't be you you just need to sort of fight pretty hard for it i think you do which is obviously the reason dnad exists well pretty much the main reason Naresh, do you do i mean again stepping aside uh, from the debate a bit do you, do you have any thoughts on people starting out now um, of whom many will be watching this yeah uh, um, we're going to take some questions from them a bit later so um, absolutely, I think, um, and I think it, it sort of, my view of it does really go to the specialist and generalist debate, this is just my, my view, but um, the thing I was talking about in my introduction about um, being interesting and interested, um, I think there's, um, I think there's, um, 
I, I mean, I always think, um, I mean, let me see, I'm not going to answer this very well. I, every time we get a project, um, my team, our team at Pentagram, every time we get a project, um, I just think we're really, really lucky. Um, you know, clients are trusting us with their business. Um, you know, it's their neck on the line and they're trusting us to actually make their business work um, or help their reputation. And uh, I just think you've always got to, every opportunity um, is, a, is a big opportunity and you're very lucky to get it. Um, and so what I guess I'm saying is um, the reason I started thinking more um more positively about the generalist idea is about really about think is about thinking more positively positively which i always do about people who are interested in every single element or every single opportunity um for me just never really having a specialism like cat it it would be a it would be a big bet and maybe not a great bet to say i am about this thing i am going to go at it and go at it until um until i get it i suppose i'm i i'm more I think if I was starting out now, I'd probably be more in the position of thinking, I will just try it and help anywhere I can and try as many things as I can until um, the thing that feels right for me and I feel right for becomes apparent. Um, and so I think just having a little bit of sort of elastic elasticity of the things you're prepared to do. Um, and that's, I think, goes for someone starting out um, now, as well as, for example, my team. Um, working, we're open to all, all opportunities apart from ones that are non-sustainable. Um, yeah. You know, I think is a, re is a really, really good thing and staying sort of flexible and open-minded and humble and thankful for every opportunity uh, and trying to make the most of it, I think is the right, is, personally, I think is the right attitude anyway, um, but I would say now even more so. Yeah, I mean, there is this idea, isn't there, which has been around for a long time of, of T-shaped uh, people, T-shaped creatives who, who have oh, yeah. a deep specialism but a basic knowledge of related disciplines and and who can sort of bring you know other disciplines to bear on their specialism uh, i guess yeah. i mean yeah. i'm going to ask cat about this i mean there was a an old uh, professional golfer called gary player who once famously said uh, the more i practice the luckier i get and it, that's a sort of version of malcolm gladwell's thing which is you know it, it takes 10 hours of practice before you can master a craft yeah. How many hours have you actually put in, Kat, do you reckon? <laughs> God, that's a question. Um, it will be thousands, won't it, though, obviously. I would guess so. I mean, because uh, after graduating, I mean, I, I really went for it. I, not a lot of sleep, not a lot of sleep for quite a while, <laughs> um, which my parents can both attest to as well. Um, I think... I think the more you know a subject, though, the more you feel like you don't know it as well. Like, the, the more I learn about illustration, the more I feel like, oh, there's so much more that I can learn about this. I think it was Hokusai getting towards 100 years old. He was just like, I, I think I've got it now. I think I'm finally there. <laughs> it's like right, Grandmaster. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Naresh, any, any thoughts on that, on, on how long it takes and what kind of what kind of person is prepared to sort of devote their life to being good at brilliant brilliantly good at one thing it's such a romance that's the thing i'd love to do that i'd love to have been i'd love to have dedicated my life to being the semicolon expert of the world <laughs> uh, uh, and um and who knows i mean i just did a little toss up of my hours i, I calculated 30 years working which is roughly right to so within a year 220 days a year you're supposed to be working times eight hours um you know roughly Although I think I've worked a bit more than that because I'm slow, um, which I've just made come, I think comes to about 53,000 hours. Um, and, and so the trouble I'm not a specialist is because I, I have to cover about 11 or 12 things. Yeah. I suppose I'm a, I'm a specialist at being average at a lot of things. Does that count? <laughs> oh, don't put yourself down. That's, you know that's not true. I do um, know that's true. That is great. I don't, we'll see where the poll goes at the end of this, but uh, we've got some uh, terrific questions uh, coming in uh, and I think we should we should spend some time uh, on those uh, so here's a question from Simeon um, so he uh, is asking is there a time at which transitioning from generalist to specialist becomes more difficult or impossible so is there a, is there a point beyond which you're never going to be a specialist cat do you think that's that I don't really think so um, but I also have a few so 
when I was teaching, I have a few choice examples of illustrators that I like to use where um, they started their careers relatively late in life. Yuko Shimizu, I think, started in her 30s, and she's one of the most prolific illustrators working today. Um, I don't think it's ever too late to specialize. No. Um, I do think that um, there can be a bit of a point. It, it can be hard to make that leap, for sure. When I was teaching, um, it came to a point, I think maybe about five years ago, where I was getting more and more illustration work, um, but I was still working like quite a lot of teaching hours. And then I was essentially having two full-time jobs. And although it seemed fairly obvious that I should just quit the teaching job and just focus on the illustration job, it, it took me a good one or two years to actually make that leap because I was just thinking, well, what if I don't get any commissions in the next month? I, you know, it's a gamble. But um, when I did make that decision, it, it was just the best decision I made because then I could just focus entirely on illustration and my work suddenly improved so, so much. Like the learning curve of it was so steep. Uh, so I never regretted that decision. Interesting. That's great. It's a question from Rafter. Do, do you think that certain roles require you to be a specialist or a generalist only? I, I think actually we covered that earlier, didn't we, about, you know, where, where you, you're operating in, in terms of the development uh, yeah. process, probably. I think um, so. I was going to ask Tim, could, do you mind if I ask something? Is, is, was Simeon asking that first question because they're at that point now? Uh, it's not clear from the question. I, maybe Simeon could, could write in again to the Q&A and uh, let us know. About I'd, love to know I'd love to know if you've got a choice ahead of you because it would be yes. nice to hear about that. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, here's, here's another question, uh, 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 anonymous. Uh, how, how would you balance promoting your adaptability and range of skills? or promoting any specialisms and key interests, and this in the context of a CV or job application when starting out in the industry and building your reputation. That's got, Naresh, any, any thoughts on that? We've kind of... Uh, yeah, yeah, um, I do actually. Um, it's, I, I, I just think it's, um, I think it's, I think it's really good to um, tell a mostly consistent story. I mean, I just think this is my, I suppose this is my training, I think even in communication. Um, communicating, um, communicating brands, or organizations, or communicating yourself. I think it's really good to have a basic story that you tell consistently, consistently, but then have like um, a percentage, like twenty percent, thirty percent, that you vary for the opportunity, because you're you need to be, um, you know, proud and consistent, but also empathetic to the opportunity. So, um, uh, and and every time we do a proposal at Pentagram, it we um, we we do that you know it's it's we'll never overplay anything because i just don't believe in overplaying things but i think you can naturally push forward the experience you've done for example around um you know uh, we're doing something with um um an, on, an online health service now and you can show that you have done experience with you have done projects with online health services and the next day it's a proposal for um i don't know an ngo and you can talk about the work you've done with greenpeace and amnesty etc so i think you can you can shape to you can shape to a specialism um, according to the opportunity without being dishonest, um, which I think is the right. I personally, I think it's the right thing to do in our business. Right. Uh, news just in from Simeon, who <laughs> says, uh, "No, I've just graduated. I was more curious in terms of future planning." So, uh, Kat, uh, a, a question for you, which I, I, I like this a lot from Alice Morris. So she, she asked, part of the issue for me is not being com confident enough to commit to one area. Mm. Kat, what gave you the confidence to commit? At what, at what point did you realize you were gonna be a brilliant illustrator? <laughs> well, um, I think in terms of committing to one area, it was a lot of it was to do with the things I enjoyed absorbing. So I read a lot of journalism, I read a lot of nonfiction, so it kind of made sense that I would gravitate towards that as, as material. Um, and, and I definitely agree with Naresh that like, it's, it's important to be open to a lot of opportunities that come your way. So for all I know, maybe if I ended up getting a lot of commissions for something else, I would have gone in a different direction. And it just so happened I, I did get a lot of editorial commissions in. Um, but also, if you have a range of things that you like to do, when you're picking some... It, you're not committed to doing one thing for the rest of your life. So although, for example, I do editorial illustration, 
I'm working on a secret book project as well. So I, I also have other things that I will be doing on the back burner and I might not be committing 100% of my time to it, but your path as a creative, it's not linear. And thinking about um, what's well, interesting with Simeon saying, I've just graduated and thinking about future planning because you know, when I first graduated, I'm not sure I could have really predicted where I would be in 10 years time. So that's why I really think it's important to go with what you're passionate with at that moment. Like, what do you really feel drawn to? Yes, that's, that's correct. I, I, it is about having, you know, a passion and a determination to sort of realize that, isn't it? So mm -hmm. a, a question from Vandita, uh, and this for you, Naresh, initially. So very simple. Do, do you think copywriters need to be or tend to be generalists? Um. Yeah, it's a really good question. I, um, sorry, I'm reading the questions as well because Rebecca's asked a similar question in a way, or it's got the same answer, I think, yep. about she's asking whether um, for her first job, should she build the for for portfolio as a specialist or a generalist? Yep. Yep. And um, if I can answer both those questions or try to give my version of both the answer of both those questions, I'm not sure if there'll be a satisfying answer, but um, I think um, it's really important to find your style um, and communicate and 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 apply that style, apply that method to whatever job and show that it can show it, show that it can apply to a broad range of um, a broad range of applications. So what I mean by that is um, um, whether you're um, go, say, for example, let's take something like um, um, being funny or being stylish, right? So, so, so two, two different approaches to creativity and I'm being really, really simplistic. Um, a certain kind of job may ask you to be funny and a certain kind of job may ask you to be stylish. But I think so long as you can do both of those in your way, which is, you know, for us, I, I think it would be about engaging with things intelligently, um, you know, finding some sort of disruptive um, form of words and um, pictures or behaviors, and then um, executing to the best possible level of detail. So long as you've got your modus operandi that you can apply um, in a more general way to any any specialism, then I think you are you. I think you form your own approach and you form your own brand, but you can apply it to lots of different opportunities. And I think that's right. That's true for being a copywriter or for uh, actually being a designer or an art director. I think you've got to have your own way that comes through your work, but that should be a way that can actually be um, in a way generalist neutral. Very interesting. Um, just again, just stepping away from the actual debate for a second, because a lot of the people uh, watching will be sort of, starting out on their careers. And uh, so Betty Guerra has asked, what's your advice for creatives who are being made redundant due to the pan pandemic? And I'd add actually creatives who are, who are just graduating and looking for work in the industry. Should they rethink their spe specialisms or take on a more generic role? Kat, any thoughts on that at all? Mm. Tough out there. <laughs> That's a really tough question. Um, I think, well, so as I mentioned, when I first graduated, it was also uh, the financial crash. And I found that I had to, uh, yeah, find different areas, different ways that I could fund doing the thing that I wanted to do, um, which is where I actually uh, got quite good at writing grant applications. And that was when I first appreciated doing all those essays in university. It was like, that actually makes you quite good at writing grant applications. So um, I got used to writing proposals to places like Arts Council England, Creative Scotland, all of those. Um, and considering that the government has just made a promise to give a huge amount of their budget to the arts and culture sector, it wouldn't surprise me if uh, institutions like Arts Council England will be putting forward new grants sort of aimed towards creatives who have suffered from the pandemic. I mean, quite a few, uh, I know that Creative Scotland and Society of Authors have released grants to illustrators for sure um, to support them during this time. But as a, as a new uh, graduate, it is, it, I can appreciate it is more difficult because you're right at the start of it. Um, but I, I do think like, finding supporting jobs kind of is the normal thing to do like whether that's teaching so like I was teaching like life drawing and illustration evening classes and things like that thank you Naresh any any quick thoughts uh, on, on yeah on 
people are starting out or finding it's a, out of a job? It's a really good. It's a really good question. I'd say um, my quick thought would be, um, I think the, the the hardest thing is to step into the world of work um, because you're you're an outsider until you're inside the system. I think when you're in the system, you can then move around. It's um it's a little easier to get in than move around than it is to wait for that perfect job. I I personally think so. I would say you should be open to any opportunity, regardless of whether it's for your absolute specialism, pr brackets, passion or not. Um, do what um, Kat is saying, which is keep your passion alive through um, personal projects or side projects. And then once you're in, once you're, once you've got, once you've got employment, um, you know, not very quickly, because then that's disloyal to your new employer, you know, after a couple of years or whatever the right time span is now, you look you know, you look for the opportunities to move towards a role um, in your second role where you can actually bring your specialism or your passion to play. Yes, that's great. Thank, thank you. Um, I'm conscious of time and um, we've had a lot of questions. We've, we've managed to answer some. We've also uh, ranged fairly widely from, from the actual central debate, which is also good. So we're, we're going to uh, rerun the poll uh, now to see uh, whether our audience's views have shifted. Uh, in the face of your eloquence. So uh, I think that should be on your screens now, folks, if you could just vote and we'll, we'll get a, a result in a, up in a second. Oh, panelists can't vote. No, sorry about that. <laughs> well, who would you have voted for, actually? Then? <laughs> well, okay, there has, has been a shift. So when we started, 60% uh, uh, were in favor of generalists uh, and that has reduced somewhat to 55 uh, and 40% were in favour of specialists, and that has gone up uh, uh, commensurately to 45%. Um, so congratulations on your eloquence, Kat, uh, and well done also, Naresh. <laughs> That's very good. There is, a day, there is a day, I'm looking at this poll, and there is a day in about 30 years' time where that will be a general election result, right? Red 45%, yeah. <laughs> blue 45%, but... Exactly. Um, I'm hoping. Thank you both so much uh, for agreeing to come on and, and sharing your wit, wisdom and experience with us. Uh